Welcome to Nation Beat. I am Jacques Kingston Compton, bringing you this brief on the pulse of our nation and highlights around the heart of St. Lucia. St. Lucians are urged to keep an eye on the revived tropical storm Kirk. Students are armed to combat the biggest crime perpetrated in cyberspace. Remote polio's influence on the Denry segment is revealed. And helping improve the cottage industry one pastry at a time. Tropical Storm Kirk has re-emerged in the Atlantic and is barreling towards the Windward Islands. Consequently, a tropical storm warning was issued for St. Lucia. Kirk is moving toward the west near 18 miles per hour. On this forecast track, the center will move over the Lesser Antilles on Thursday night. Residents and interests in and around St. Lucia and the rest of the Eastern Caribbean islands are strongly advised to continue monitoring the progress of Kirk. The National Emergency Management Organization is urging the public to review their emergency plans. Communications manager Curran Xavier says emergency supplies must be checked and vehicles fueled before any eventuality. Buildings, windows and loose outdoor objects must be secured. So when a, a warning is issued, as is the case for St. Lucia, we ask persons to activate that plan which they created ahead of the storm and do certain things. For instance, start storing drinking water. Turn the refrigerators and the freezers to the coldest settings. So if in case electricity is lost, the food is going to stay much longer. During the passage of any system, especially weather-related systems, we ask persons to remain indoors. That is the safest place for them to be. And then we always ask them, and that's the most important aspect, is to monitor the radios, monitor the media, and listen to advisories only from the NEMO Secretariat and the Met Office. Residents in low-lying areas are asked to exercise caution as flash flooding and mudslides can pose a danger. The Ministry of Education and the Department of Public Service are collaborating on a cybercrime prevention program for students benefiting from the Government Island Wide Network or GINET project. As we hear from Anicia Antoine, the team made another stop on its roadshow. The Royal St. Lucia Police Force, in collaboration with the Ministry of Education and Department of the Public Service, continues to educate students on cybercrime prevention. This initiative is as a result of the newly installed government island-wide network made accessible to the primary and secondary school students. The cybercrime prevention training sessions are focused mainly on child soliciting, malicious software, cyber harassment, and cyber bullying. We know the environment we live in right now um, and the dangers that exist. And people may not be aware, we all use smartphones, we all online, we all use social media. And this initiative is intended to sensitize, starting with the young people, um, on the dangers that exist in the online in the online world and to take be more proactive ensuring that they secure themselves their their belongings their their assets everything um their money and um, just being aware of that cybercrime exists and what measures they could take to protect themselves according to sergeant joshua kami the most common type of cybercrime in saint lucia is identity theft the students of the Viewfort Comprehensive School received a level 2 training on computer misuse and cybercrime. With cybercrime, we had levels that affected um, younger children as compared to the adults. So I remained focused on the areas that affected um, those students from um, 8 years, 7 years, up to about 10 years, 11 years. Whereas with the secondary school, we're dealing with um, people from 12, 14 years up until um, 15, 16, 17 years. So the content was different, right? Although the objectives, the focus were the same, the content was different. And I also gave them better means, more advanced means of protecting themselves so they will not be cybercrime victims. Um, this included um, changing the passwords to strong passwords, avoid um, putting too much personal information on websites, especially when creating emails. 
The final sessions for the Cybercrime Prevention Initiative will be held at the Miku Primary and Secondary Schools on September 27th. From the Government Information Service, I am Anisia Antoine reporting. The time frame for the completion of the Denry Polyclinic has changed. The sword-turning ceremony for the construction of the Denry Polyclinic took place on Thursday, March 8, 2018 at Wajoli. According to technical experts on the project, there was a long period of preparatory works that included site identification and preparation, detailed architectural designs, and a protracted international bidding and procurement process. The project was expected to be completed within a period of 18 months. However, officials have indicated that due to recently surfaced challenges, the completion time will be lengthened. One of the critical issues that has brought us to this stage is that um, during the excavation of the foundation for the, for the, the buildings, we recognize that um, there are two or three ravines which pass through the site. This, of course, um, um, meant that we would need to undertake some sort of redesign of the structure. Right? Um, this was one of the pieces of information that the, the, the contractor requested. Having requested that information, we now had to provide the clarification for the contractor. Right? Clarification could not be provided by ECMC, the supervision, um, supervising consultant, and um, we obviously asked the the client being the, the Ministry of Works to undertake um, to prepare that information. Currently, we have a number of um, RFIs with, um, requests for information that have that remained unanswered, and um, as a result of that, the Ministry is forced now to seek alternative services so as to get um, the redesigns or designs or modifications of the structures so as to move forward. According to officials at the Ministry of Infrastructure, all efforts are being made to provide feedback for the requests for information. However, the various entities are finding difficulty in doing so. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry for Infrastructure, Ivor Daniel, cited that despite the challenges, some good has come out of the project. We as a Department of Infrastructure, we've been attempting now to respond or to answer those requests for information. And it has proven very difficult for me as permanent secretary, um, as the accounting officer. It has caused us not sleepless nights in a sense, but many hours of discussion and deliberation at the Department of Economic Development. And it has caused us as agencies and along with the Department of Health to bond together as a team. Normally you find ministries operating in silos and they don't come together. But it's been able to bring us together as three critical agencies and it has caused us to understand even our consultant how he operates and how he executes his mandate. The Ministry of Economic Development has indicated, however, that work is ongoing to redesign the project and to find solutions to the many challenges which persist. But we're working assiduously to have it done in the shortest possible time. Um, maybe a range of uh, six weeks to three months. I mean, don't hold me to it, but we're looking at having, you know, uh, the design modifications completed in the shortest possible time. And from there, we'll be able to uh, determine the cost. The Polyclinic, which forms part of the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project, funded by the World Bank before the redesign thrusts, was estimated to cost over 5 million EC dollars. This is Nation Beat. Coming up, Ramo Polio's influence on the Denry segment. What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too We consume and we don't spare a thought for the damage that they'll do the that No, they do. think about the children Think about the children How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution 
Excessive agrochemical use, additives and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy and consume organic. A message from Rice St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The good food revolution. Welcome back. A new ecosystems management project in Fosse Jacques Souffre aims to improve sustainable land practices over the next few years. The initiative is entitled Integrating Water, Land and Ecosystems Management in Caribbean Small Island Developing States. Aretha Dashville, the National Project Coordinator, says the project was initiated as a response to the vulnerability of small island states to climate change. IW Eco is a project funded by the Global Environment Facility and implemented through the UN Environment. Okay. It is a regional program and it actually, s its genesis stemmed from the fact that small island developing states are, effect are affected more by climate change than other areas in the globe. Mm. Hence, governments in the region have to ensure that communities and ecosystems must be resilient. Dr. Donathian Gustav, research officer in the Forest and Lands Department, says government's aim is to build such resilience by educating communities about the importance of conservation. What we really want to do is to get the partial cooperation of GEF, mm -hmm. the Global Environmental Fund, mm -hmm. to empower communities to do conservation. Mm -hmm. And IW Eco, the main function is to partner with them to empower communities to make the decisions. Ultimately, the project seeks to improve the livelihoods of farmers. In St. Lucia, it's very targeted. It targets the Upper Souffre watershed, which is really Fosse Jacques and environs. Mm -hmm. And it seeks to mitigate the poor biophysical conditions really caused by unsustainable land practices, mm -hmm. but that affect the livelihoods of farmers. Mm -hmm. The Integrating Water, Land and Ecosystems Management Project commenced in October of 2017 and will end in October of 2020. The Department of Transport is moving toward creating an environment of compliance on the nation's roads. Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport and Civil Aviation, the Honorable Guy Joseph, has announced that government is negotiating the establishment of an impoundment lot. Minister Joseph says motorists who fail to obey and practice the basic rules of driving will have their vehicles towed and held in the pound. If you take right here in front of the government buildings, double yellow lines and cones still do not stop people from parking at the entrance of the government buildings. And we are saying that as a country, this is unacceptable. We are sending the wrong signals when it comes to the basic things that needs to be followed. And if the rules are not going to be followed, where the administrative head of government is, and we drive in here, and I'm sure you come in and you see it all the time, people drive up on the sidewalk, they park their vehicle, halfway on the double yellow line, there are cones on the other side, and there's always congestion in this area. What we are doing is we, once the, the terms of setting up the pound is completed, a couple of wreckers will be hired, and what would happen is that when a vehicle is badly packed, it would be towed away, and it would be done at the expense of the individual. Because these are basic rules that we must be able to abide by. Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport and Civil Aviation, the Honorable Guy Joseph. Home-based bakers who operate commercially have completed training facilitated by Caribbean Grains. Geraldine Bissett Joseph has details on the outreach program by the company. Caribbean Grains View Fort held another successful baking training session in September, this time for commercial bakers who operate from home. The company's continuing program of training is part of a pledge to not only sell a range of flour to the local market, but to also pass on professional techniques to enable bakers to get the most out of products. 
Director of Sales and Marketing at Caribbean Grains, De Costa Pierre, said home-based bakeries were crucial to the baking industry because they produce a variety of pastries and cakes for sale to the public. Ideally, our goal is to develop the baking industry and we have noticed that homeowners play a critical role in baking, baking from home and all to cakes and various pastries. They sell to various institutions and they also cater. And we believe that um, in developing the industry, taking a wholesome approach, working with bakers or homeowners who bake, or also working with professional bakers is the way to help in developing that industry into what we want it to become. Improvement that we've noticed during, throughout the training that we have extended to various um, bakers and, and customers of ours that you see a better quality, a better finished product, a better tasting product. The customers are able to um, calibrate or measure and ensure that they're able to maximize on the usage of the tools that they are provided with, which is the flour, the yeast, and everything of that sort. Trainee Gail Rigi of Artisan Pastries, which operates out of Union Terrace, Castries, said she was pleasantly surprised to learn the new knowledge obtained. One thing that I learned here, and I think I will definitely implement, is the fact that you need to let your, your dough rest, let, allow it to rest a lot more so we can get a better quality product. This is the first thing that I'm going to try out. Janie Girodi, who runs the home-based company, Janie's Exquisite Cakes of Moulin Chic View Fort, said she came away with ideas and techniques, mainly in the baking of bread. I learned different techniques of how to use the flour, how to make baskets, how to make different types of decorations with the, with the bread dough a lot of how to make a lot of different things using flour. Not only white flour, but we have rye flour, you had whole grain, you had all different types of flours, which was very informative. So far, baking training sessions by Caribbean Grains have instilled more confidence in participants about the preparations of ingredients to improve the presentation and taste of breads, cakes and pastries. Ali Majahad, French baker, instructor, attached to Caribbean Grains, said the participants' involvement was great during the session. I had a, I had a great group. I mean, as usual, you know, I, the way I, di I direct my sessions is that, yes, it's work. Yes, we have a goal to actually uh, 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 promote and uh, uh, use a product that is uh, uh, on the market today in St. Lucia, but um, I like the the kind of interest and obviously the, the, the involvement, the huge involvement of each participant, right? Uh, you always have uh, uh, one that gives a joke or, or is more uh, happy than the rest, but today the session was just uh, so delightful and for me it makes it even easier. Since commencing business in November 2016, Caribbean Grains has conducted baking training sessions for groups of community bakers, school students and hotel pastry chefs as part of its mission to provide solutions to the baking industry. For the Government Information Service, I am Jolene Bissett Joseph reporting. The edutainment roadshow featuring the work of cultural icon Joseph Ramo Polio made another stop on Wednesday, this time at the Castries Comprehensive Secondary School. Students were not only introduced to the folk hero, but they were exposed to the link between today's popular music and the traditional songs. Here's Janelle Norville. Icon series, the foundation engaged a group of budding arts and cultural enthusiasts in what is termed a cultural crew. The Cultural Icon Series is a national event that honors persons who have left an indelible mark on the artistic and cultural landscape of St. Lucia, as well as youthful and exuberant cultural activists. The fourth edition of the initiative features St. Lucia's renowned folk musician, Joseph Ramopolio. The cultural group then embarked on an educational drive by sharing snippets of their experience with students around the island. Intended to visit 12 schools, and I must say that we have we are almost completed the 12 schools and we try to choose schools that um, that are not normally people don't normally go we went to as far as Saltibus, Denry, Miku, Viewfort and now we're within the Castries Basin, Marshall, Methodist 
to really heighten that awareness and I think overall it has been well received and I think what baffles me every time this is not something where literature is written on a board or it scrolls up on a screen but they actually have to listen and how the students can recall all of those details and give the specific information where he was born his name his parents name what instrument that he played and I think we want to show that transition into our folk traditions yes we must maintain it and keep it but we must also innovate and show the transition into a more contemporary form of culture where we embrace ourselves what we're promoting is what is authentic authentically solution. A 20-minute presentation which includes music, song, narrative and dance documenting the life of Ramo and his contribution to the arts were made to students throughout the various schools on the island. The schedule for Thursday 26 September 2018 included the Castries Comprehensive Secondary School, the Bonte Preparatory School and the Montessori Center. The teachers and students alike gave some insight into their experience. Today was an experience for our theatre arts students to observe a theatrical production, dance and drama and musical, um, which focused on the history and the contribution that a cultural icon, Ramon Polio, has made to St. Lucia. And so it was, I think, an experience for them to learn about their country and themselves and to see contemporary as well as traditional music and elements within the cultural forms that they have been studying in a practical way. I find it was an overall good performance and I learned more about my culture and Ramo and Polia. I learned that he was a very good icon and people looked up look forward to yeah people looked forward to um they looked at him they looked at him as an idol. Well, young people, that culture, little because how are they have the dancing is actually nice. I didn't expect it to be nice. I didn't even know they had more than one cultural form of that. I learned that although many of us, the youth today, like we don't really gravitate towards the folk music, we more gravitate towards like the Denry segment and the American music. The folk music is really nice, and the dances are well, they better in my opinion, and I really enjoyed it. The Cultural Icon series forms part of Arts and Heritage Month. In previous years, icons who have been recognized include Virginia Alexander 2015, Honorable Charles Cadet 2016, Garth St. Omar 2017. This year's showcase strings, songs and dance celebrating Ramo will take place on Monday, October 1 at the Bellevue Primary School Courtyard from 5 p.m. Admission to the cultural celebration is $10. From the Government Information Service, I am General Norville. The office of the mayor will in the coming days assist in bridging the gap between the end of a child's school day and the end of a parent's workday when it launches its first ever after-school program. The program, dubbed PASS, Partners for After School Success, will offer free lessons in English and Mathematics three days a week to disadvantaged students preparing for CXC. The after-school program was endorsed during a recent meeting with the Minister for Education, Innovation, Gender, Relations and Sustainable Development, Dr. Gail Rigobert. Speaking ahead of the launch, His Worship Mayor Peterson D. Francis notes that after-school programs have been proven to increase academic achievement as well as reduce financial stress on families. Interested persons can call 452 2121 for more information or register for the program at the office of the mayor, Pena Street, Castries. And that's Nation Beat. Join us next time as we feel the pulse and heart of our community. I am Jacques Kingston Compton.